Your Majesty, Colin Chartis, Water Laureate, Water Laureates, Water Friends, we do truly live on a crowded planet. We're 7 billion people, we're committed to 9 billion people, but the key pressure on the planet is not the numbers, it's really the affluence revolution. We're moving from 1.5 billion people, the minority that stepped onto the diets and the modern civilization as we know it, but now we're moving very positively towards a world with 4 or 5 billion middle class equivalents aspiring for the same kind of diets and lifestyles as the rich minority. We have a second pressure, which is, of course, the anthropogenic climate change, which is shifting the entire stability of the energy system on Earth. But as if that was not enough, we are also destabilizing our ecosystem base. We're actually losing ecosystem services faster than ever before in human history, as far as science can tell. And unfortunately, we're learning that nature is not behaving as we thought. It's not like this Walmart shopping mall where you just take out goods and services and when a resource goes down, you simply just fill up the shelves again. Nature is full of surprise and tipping points and shocks. This is such a change of our agenda that it has been suggested that we may be moving into a new geological era, the Anthropocene. But water is central to all of this. It's actually a determinant for the stability of human development and social stability and economic growth. It is a determinant of the climate stability. It is entirely part of all biodiversity and ecosystem services as a growth factor in biomass. And it's also part of building resilience in ecosystems. But it's also a victim. In fact, water is hit by all these integrating forces. And this has led to the dramatic scientific conclusion that we may have become our own geological era. We may be hitting the ecological ceiling of the capacity of planet Earth to support our modern world as we know it. This may be the most insightful and important starting point for a transition towards global sustainability. It has tremendous water implications. And colleagues in Finland with Olivaris and uh, let's see what's happening here. Perhaps I do like that. Yes. Olivaris and Kumin colleagues have also shown that it's the same journey of exponential pressures on the planet when it comes to water. Here you have in color the numbers you all know, the 3.5 billion people still suffering from various degrees of water scarcity on planet Earth, half of the world's population. But look at the dotted lines. This is the exponential success story of our efforts of chasing our own tail. This is the journey of expansion of water reservoirs, groundwater extraction, irrigation development. So we've done so much good work to meet growing demands for water, but still half of the world's population is suffering from water scarcity in a situation where we still need to feed 1 billion hungry and move towards 9 billion people. So we have this collision of a narrowing space of ecology on planet Earth and the biosphere with growing social demands. Now the reality is, I'm sorry about this. There we are, let's do it that way. The reality is that we're moving towards a future which is really challenging for humanity. This is our effort of saying, what is the predicament in 2050, even if we do close the yield gap, even if we do shrink diets down to 2,200 kilocalories per person, even if we do improve water productivity to a state where we might be enough with three cubic meters of water per person per day to meet our food needs, three tons of water. We would have almost four billion people on the planet living in regions where there is enough water to produce food. We would have 3.6 billion people roughly that would live in regions where there is water scarcity, but there is economic potential to be part of trade. But 1.5 billion people still living in areas where we cannot find that we are be being able to lift ourselves out of a biophysical and social predicament on water. So we need a new green revolution. But this is not any green revolution. We need to increase food production by 70% by 2050. That is a green revolution, but it has to be sustainable, a double green revolution. And we've concluded that it has to be an integration of blue water management and irrigation with radically boosting productivity in rain agriculture, which is based on green water, the soil moisture, which is on its way back to the atmosphere. Why is this? Well, because the world is largely green. This is a map showing various percentage of our dependence on rainfall, which Your Majesty knows from your farm as well, that in fact the largest part, 80% or so of the agricultural land on, on Earth, depends on rainfall creating green water going back to the atmosphere. This is an enormous untapped potential to invest more in rain-fed farming systems in a situation where we need to boost productivity. But the pressures are not enough to understand. We need to go to the Arctic to understand our full predicament. This is how we want the Arctic to look like, a white surface, a regulating biome, which is contributing also to the stability of the geological cycle. 
But in 2007, science and the world were shocked. In two months, the Arctic lost 30% of its summer ice. Now, that could have been an outlier, but it happened again in 2010. and 2012, five days ago, NASA points out we have a new bottom point. Arctic may have entered a death spiral. Why is it a death spiral? Because the feedback that self-accelerates warming is so well known. A white surface changes to a dark surface, and it gets a self-accelerated warming by taking up more solar radiation. This is what we're nervous about. We're seeing in the coral reefs in the world biodiverse rich systems which are pushed over thresholds due to not only overfishing and climate change, but also due to mismanagement in agriculture causing nutrient pollution, leading to tipping points where a trigger like El Nino knocks the whole system over. The projection is that by 2050 we may no longer have diverse, rich, livelihood supporting tropical coral reefs, today supporting 250 million people in coastal regions. So we need to understand that it's not only the pressures, it's the risk of nonlinear change. And we have a whole catalog today showing that rainforests may tip to savannas, that steppes may become deserts, that forest patterns are changing, all the way to the scale of the planet. That is why we gathered a whole group of global environmental change scientists to say, in the Anthropocene, with all these pressures, how can we provide a framework, a science framework, to guide a transition to global sustainability? We call this planetary boundaries. It's the question, what are the environmental processes that we have to be stewards of to have an Earth system that can stay stable and support the modern economy? We find nine big planetary boundary processes. So it's not only climate change. I won't go through all the nine, but just to say that global freshwater use in this scientific analysis clearly is a global planetary boundary. And we quantified it in terms of consumptive use of river flow to a level of 4,000 to 6,000 cubic kilometers per year. We are today at 2,600. So we do believe there is a window of opportunity still through wise stewardship. When we go beyond 4,000, we believe we start seeing evidence of tipping points in river basins in so many places that it could jeopardize the stability, for example, of carbon sinks. We see this pattern of interactions between planetary boundaries, which makes the water agenda so central for development at large. You all know the story of palm oil deforestation-based development in Borneo. This is not only about losing biodiversity. It's about the fact that you're drying out the whole system, losing moisture feedbacks, changing the fire pattern, causing the Asian brown cloud dynamics, which led to 30% of annual emissions of greenhouse gases in 2007, but also changes in rainfall and potential risks for the monsoon. So we know that we're emitting greenhouse gases very rapidly, here from four to nine billion tons over the past 60 years. Carbon dioxide lives in the atmosphere for 1,000 years. It should be the surface under the area here which has contributed to one degree warming so far, but no. We know that water is part of helping us by taking up 25% of emissions in oceans, another 25% in land, which is the largest ecosystem service on planet Earth. Half of our emission of greenhouse gases is taken up by the planet. But look at what's happened over the past 50 years. In fact, the planet is taking up more and more carbon, which is uh, uh, an evidence that the planet is trying to stay stable to avoid tipping points. Now, to round up here just with a couple of concluding remarks then, we believe that for water, this requires a new paradigm, a new simple paradigm which puts rainwater at the center, where we need to sustain rainfall for the future, not assume rainfall to be given, and where human activities need to be designed in a way that builds resilience and deals also with both green and blue feedbacks. The positive story is that we find no evidence that we cannot succeed in sustainably intensifying agriculture to feed a world population of nine billion people even meeting planetary boundaries. We had a session yesterday on boosting rainfall agriculture, a tremendous battery of stories of how we can use innovations from water harvesting, soil fertility management, crop management, all the way to Yanka Sharma, who I saw here, to take this to scale in Ethiopia and other parts of the world. So things can be done to move in the right direction. So to conclude then, Your Majesty, the first dramatic conclusion and message from science is human appropriation of global fresh water has entered the Anthropocene. We can no longer assume that rainfall is stable. We're all interconnected. Water for food is the largest human pressure on the biosphere, clearly. Therefore, we're part of the problem, but also part of the solution. The new global agenda is to feed the world within the safe operating space of planetary boundaries. And I chose the Arctic here as a background deliberately because so the savanna agenda on water for food depends also on managing for 
the Arctic because we all depend on these interconnected biomes. And water resilience is a new dimension. We need to now recognize that we also need to deal with stress and redundancies in landscapes so that we have landscapes that can continue to generate rainfall and sustain resilience. And the final conclusion is that we need a holistic socio-ecological strategy to integrate green-blue water strategies. We brought this forward in what we've called a new human quest for a transition to a global future, a book that we are just now releasing with Natural Geographic photographer Matthias Klum to show the stories that we actually can, through an integrated systems approach, move in the right direction. Thank you very much.